Midwest Whitetail is brought to you by Realtree, Hoyt Archery, Fuse Accessories, Muddy Outdoors, Cabela's, Trophy Rock, Scott Archery, Frigid Forage, Rocket Broadheads, Bloodsport Arrows, Redneck Hunting Blinds, Yeti Coolers, Quiet Cat, Non-Typical Wildlife Solutions, Deer Grow, Ozonics, and Nikon. The first segment on this week's episode is going to be a follow-up to last week's discussion of how to prune apple trees. This week Eli Cook is going to take us through the steps to prune a young tree so that it grows into the proper shape for high productivity. We're at a different spot now. This is one that I planted or the family and I planted uh, back in, I think it's 2011 maybe is, is when we put this in. And unfortunately we caught a really dry summer and we didn't get any rain from about the first part of June, maybe June 1 all the way through and sometime into August before it started to rain. And we brought water to these trees for a while and then I just finally gave up on it and said either they're gonna live or they're gonna die. And as it turned out, most of them died. Uh, we put 60 in here and I think we've got maybe about 10 or 12 left. Uh, and uh, Eli is gonna talk now about how to shape one of these younger trees. We went through the whole process of what to do with a tree that was in that neighborhood of about nine growing seasons old. So here's one that's in that four or five growing seasons old. And first thing he commented on was the fact that the tree should be a lot bigger. Uh, that we're not getting the full production out of these trees. And before we're all done, I'm sure we'll go over a checklist of what we need to do to get these things remedied and, and get back to where they should be. But I'll just hand it over to Eli now, and he's gonna talk about what you would do with a tree that looks like this at this age in order to, to get it so that it looks like it's supposed to when it's uh, a couple years older. The first thing I recognize is that um, uh, very important the first couple years of a tree to keep keep all that vegetation should be basically dirt so if you can either keep it sprayed you know twice a year with say roundup or something like that or keep you know some kind of permanent ground cover um, maybe that stuff like you use in your flower beds like underneath that mulch or something and kind of put it down there to keep get rid of those weeds but um, this is fairly typical of a, of a young tree you have some branches on there that are you know, maybe a little bit upright because they don't have fruit to, to bring them out yet. Um, this tree looks like it was headed, but it doesn't have uh, a very good central leader. You have all this kind of stuff coming off of there. Um, so we're going to try to clean that up a little bit. Uh, and we have some good growth here and some dead growth there. We'll try to cut that out a little bit and give you the basic uh, framework for, for a young tree. So I'll, uh, I'll get started here. This branch is, is um, still less than half the width of this uh, central leader, so I think it's okay. But it's at a really bad angle. It's gonna end up growing up like that, so we need to shoot that thing out. Uh, it's a little low, but we'll, we'll be all right with it. Since we don't really have a branch coming off here, we can make this like our main branch coming this way. So we'll just cut, cut that there. Then you want to head these side branches, like I said, um, just give them a little cut and then that puts energy back into the tree. Uh, right here, this one's coming kind of back into the tree at a weird angle, so we'll just cut that out of there. Um, this one looks like, like it has a dead limb there, so we'll take that off of there. And this one forks. I'd rather for the first for, uh, first few years to just keep like a single one there. That way we can get some uh, length on it. And this one actually has a lot of buds on it. Um, you know, it should. I don't know how much fruit we want to leave on a tree like this because it'll take some of the some of the vigor back out of the tree. Um, this is another cut you can do. It's more commonly used in peaches, but I'm going to just show it for you, but it's called a bench cut. And so you're basically making it look like a bench and it, it'll help you bring bring that limb back. But um, you want to bring, bring that limb down 
Yeah, about like that. Yep. Like I say, for for uh, fruit tree plot, that's probably a little low. We probably want that, you know, a little bit higher. But I think I think it'll kind of give you the idea of where we want to be. This top has got a uh, got a lot of issues here. We're gonna try to figure out if we can fix it. So we have a, a decent little branch coming off here. Um, this is actually probably the strongest branch of this whole top of that tree. So, Bill, I hope you don't mind if I'm going to do that. He's <laughs> killing the tree! <laughs> uh, so now we have uh, a couple more branches coming off to the side there. And we've reestablished this as one central leader up there. We don't have all that junk going around there. And then we're just going to head that back just a little bit. We're going to bring these back into balance. This one's a little big there. Uh, nip the sides of these there. So you can get the basic idea of what we have. We have um, typically you want four or five scaffold limbs that's coming out. Like I say, for a wildlife planting, cut all the ones below like below like your chest height, and then kind of bring them, spread them out. We have one strong central leader here. We have some weaker branches off the sides, and then you want to keep the strongest one there in the center. Take all the other stuff stuff out, and then um, then we just head those back, and that'll reinvigorate that tree. And in a tree like that, I would probably still use. Uh, maybe a pound of urea now and then come back um, say in May sometime and put another pound on there and try to keep try to keep that as weed free as possible so. we've wrapped up most of the cutting here uh, unfortunately I've got a lot of work in front of me to implement the things that Eli is recommending here but before I let you go uh, give us a recap of uh, what you've seen here and, and I'm assuming that my situation is fairly typical of people that are doing this recreationally. We tend to be uh, probably less diligent in some of the small things that make a big difference. And and uh, uh, so tell me, or tell the viewers and me, a uh, kind of a recap of all the things that you found that we did wrong that are fixable. All right. <laughs> yeah, the main thing I, I see is is that you got to do everything right from the beginning. And and if you can do everything right for like four years and then and you get a big enough tree that can take care of itself. Um, so if you're going to be diligent, be diligent in those first you know, three or four years in that planting time, and then you'll get a tree that, that's big enough that can, that can fight off stuff and um, kind of take care of itself. So the main thing I, I see is when, when you're planting a tree like this is make a hole very, you know, as big as you can, maybe you know, 30 inches around, probably 18 inches deep, far bigger than your root system. Um, you know, plant that plant that tree they have a little bud union it's kind of where the graft hooks to the tree you want to get that about level with the ground and um, it even kind of starts before that with getting the right varieties and and I said uh, the Liberty tree is, is highly disease resistant um, very very good tree um, there's some other ones in in the article I put that uh, that'll be good varieties to start with but um so once you have that tree, then you get it planted. Um, I really suggest like a weed barrier because it's it's kind of no no maintenance. You know, you put it down. You know, a piece like that, it's not going to cost you a dollar, but it's going to save it's going to save your trees. It's going to hold the moisture in, keep the weeds out, um, and you'll need some kind of some kind of cage like that. And uh, then your initial pruning, kind of some of the things that we went over here. And uh, then, then your tree's got a good solid foundation to, to grow up and do well. So, uh, and then fertilization, like if you're just gonna plant them and hope that they're, they're gonna grow and have enough nutrition, they're probably not. So, you know, the first year, like maybe a pound of triple 19, just kind of scattered around the edge there um, about a month after planting. And then after that, you can start pushing them a little bit more. Um, and as they, they grow that root system, they can take you know, up to a couple pounds of urea kind of spread out over the season and I really get a lot of vigor in that tree, get it up and, and get it producing some fruit. So, um, Bill has a really great site here. You know, we're kind of on a, 
on a ridge with a big valley down below us so the cold air can kind of come off. So I think he'd be in pretty good shape on frost here. So um, that's a big challenge, but, uh, but, but there's nothing more rewarding when, when you can grow an apple tree and, and, that, and that tree grows up and you get fruit off of it and uh, maybe you can harvest a deer over it. it uh, something about it's pretty special. Yeah, and we like to eat apples too, so yeah. <laughs> you know, we got enough apples here, we should have some to eat, but uh, like I said, we've been on the low end of that uh, that spectrum of just producing stuff, yeah. so we'll get busy and, and uh, we'll get this figured out, but I appreciate all your time, and the name of, of uh, Eli and Misty's business is Spring Valley Farm and Orchard, and you're in West Virginia, right? Yes. And they do sell locally there. They do not have uh, any kind of mail order or website where you could order their produce from. But uh, I guess it's not technically produce, right? It's considered fruit or what do you uh, call it? Fruit and produce. Yeah. We do a lot of sweet corn, tomatoes, all that stuff too. So. But if you, if you live in that area, uh, check them out. They do a good job. Uh, a lot of organic type uh, production and you know high quality nutrition. And uh, you said you've got a Facebook page for your business. Yes. Uh, yeah, just, if you Google Spring Valley Farm and Orchard, uh, Eli Misty Cook, it'll it'll pop up, and we we post a lot of. You know, next week we'll be planting about 8,000 trees, and we'll have videos on there and stuff like that. And um, uh, we use a lot of tree planters and different things. Um, you know, we'll do some pruning demonstrations and different things on there at different times, just for our viewers, and then update kind of what's in season. So. Yeah, well, we appreciate your time. Thank you. Yeah. That's it's awesome. Yeah, it's been fun. Yeah, we've learned a lot and. Now, like I said, I just need to get the guys from the office out of their lazy chairs and get them out here working. Or I suppose I could do it myself, but that might be asking a little too much. So now we're going to join Eric Barber as he talks about poor man plots, uh, why they're so effective. And he's going to dive into a topic that's become a little bit more, uh, I'd say, um, well-established here at Midwest Whitetail over the past couple of years. And that's planting plow down clover in order to come back with a really strong crop of big and beastie during the summer. It's March 15th and I'm back here in a familiar spot. This is the same food plot that I hunted over uh, during the late season and actually shot a nice buck out of it. And this was planted in big and beastie last year. And this was a poor man style food plot that we put in with uh, very little equipment. We actually had a push behind rototiller and um, this was an old grass field that we burned off and once we had it burned, we tilled it under and uh, got our big and beastie in the ground. But the reason we put this food plot here is because it's tucked back in an area that the farmer can't get his, his equipment into. So it's just been an overgrown, neglected part of the field for the past few years. As you can see, it backs up to a pretty good sized chunk of timber and the deer like to bed in that and we have really good access coming up um, the edge of this field where the deer aren't gonna be when we're entering the stand and then they come out of this timber and work their way into the food plot. So what we're doing today is we're gonna frost seed some uh, frigid forage plow down clover. And the idea behind this is you're adding a lot of key nutrients, especially nitrogen, into the soil. Um, adding this, this plow down clover can be compared to adding up to 100 pounds of nitrogen actually. And it has a lot more benefits than just that. It also will help with your weed suppression um, having clover here throughout the spring and summer growing months will uh, give turkeys a spot to uh, feed during the spring turkey season and then also create a good food source for lactating does and fawns once they start to drop. Then moving into late summer when we start to plant our turnips, we'll till this under and the clover adds a lot of that nitrogen that the turnips need to grow. So that'll all be here, it'll be prepped, it'll be a great seed bed to then grow our turnips in for some late season hunting food plots. So we're gonna get to work right now. Um, I'm gonna drag, I'm gonna run a drag over this plot, kinda scratch it up a little bit, really expose the soil. Then I'm just gonna run over it with the cedar, get it spread and that'll be it for the day. just got done dragging over the food plot. As you can see, we got a real nice seed bed that got a lot of the thatch off, but there is still a fair amount of uh, turnip matter and grass and that kind of stuff. And for that reason, uh, they recommend about eight to 10 pounds per acre. This is a half acre plot. So we're gonna seed it like an acre because we have all that thatch on there. Not all these seeds are gonna make it. So a quick tip too for um, 
measuring your seed, we have a 25 pound bag there. That's good for like about three acres. A little fish scale like that, you can, uh, I got a Ziploc bag here that we've, we uh, dumped our seed into. And then you can weigh it with the fish scale. And I know that this bag is right around three and a half pounds. So if I add two of those in there, that's gonna be right around where we want for this half acre plot. So we're gonna get to work spreading the seed and uh, hopefully have a nice lush clover plot that then is gonna help us have a good turnip plot this fall. Well, that's it for this week's episode. Next week, we're gonna dive into more in the field action uh, with some scouting and some tree stand placement tips. Well, I appreciate you joining me. We'll see you right back here again next week for the next episode of Midwest Whitetail. And remember to always dream big.